the, the concern that we all have, though, isn't it, is that we're seeing what's going on with CD sales. We're seeing a decline, aggressive year on year, quarter by quarter, very rapid decline in CD yeah. sales. You've seen the, the figures that Music Ally just, just published, mm -hmm. the impression just published, yeah. suggesting that actually an interest in purchasing digital is actually declining. See, as but well. that, that, so, is, that is purchasing a download. Right. What I didn't see in any of those numbers was the consumption of digital media. Maybe you go from um, downloading a song upon iTunes. Maybe now you're spending an hour a night on YouTube. Well, YouTube has music. YouTube has advertising surrounding that music. And you're paid for the use of that music on, on YouTube. So I would say to, and to like an artist, go create contests with your fans to create videos to put on YouTube, to be socially voted, to be, to be top, create 50 million views, and pocket $100,000 so, you so it's a different way of looking at it. Okay, and are you confident, do you think, that, that for your artists today, that you can collect, monetize, account accurately, and know precisely where all those are? Absolutely. Are I mean, them. the famous black box scenario you know, that's risen its head on a few occasions. It's not, it's not a problem for you guys. Well, Network in 2007, in our calendar year, um, all of the income created by our, by our intellectual property was 60% digital. 40% physical. We expect this year digital to surpass 70% of our overall income on our intellectual property. And we're a very profitable company now. Two years ago, we were not. And where does live play into that? Um, live is, you know, live can be everywhere from, from what the Bare Naked Ladies do, which are they record every, every single show. You can buy it digitally the day after, or that night as you're leaving the you know, venue, you can <coughs> buy the show that you just heard on a USB stick. It's, it's all different ways. All you're really doing is monetizing the behavior of the consumer versus telling them what to do, which was the old model. We used to, it used to be a push model. You have to hear it to this place to hear the music, this place to buy the music, and this is how much you're going to pay for it. And there's little or no competition with inside each part of those models. It was only the, the, the competitive nature of the players within it. Um, we're now in a whole society, we're in the millennium generation, different habits, different consumption, um, and what I found interesting in those um, uh, stats was still the need to own, because what I've seen in the surveys that I've seen is the generation coming up, the need to own is not so prevalent, it's, it's the need for access, and right now the only way that they can access a lot of what they want is in the P2P world. They have people can start coming up with legal ways of doing that or legalizing those P2P worlds. That's what they're after. They're after choice. All they're after is, is to access it when and how they want and not being told how to do that. So, so uh, I, this is, I think, a really critical distinction because it is an absolute change in the outlook. And, and I agree that those, those figures that we just saw perhaps don't necessarily reflect that change. Yeah. So, much. But, so, so I, one of the things I'm interested in is that you've tried and you've had the opportunity to try a whole bunch of these different things. And everyone at the moment is still, amazingly, 10 years on, we're still talking about experiment and, and change, which is uh, it's great fun, but it's interesting for us to in that way. Of all the different things that you've tried recently, where do you, what's been the most successful week for you? Can you can describe a promotional approach that you think is a particular artist or particular band that's been the most successful for you? Well, I mean, two of the most recent ones, which I which really quite like, um, was the launch of the Avril Levine single, which we did in eight different languages. Um, and we had an um, anime manga behind it, driving it visually. Um, had it all DRM free, um, allowed mashups. And at the end of the day, her first single sold 7.3 million digital songs in one year. Um, what, was, what was fascinating is her album sales were about 5.5 million. Her track sales are over 15 million, and literally about 40% Asia, about 30% Europe, and about 30% North America. She is essentially an economically flat artist, and she can play live shows any, um, anywhere. Another situation was the, bit, the Bare Naked Ladies' last studio record, where they did 29 songs, but we ended up with close to 300 in individual pieces, you know, or assets, or different pieces of property, whether it was Fan, you know, fan, fan mix singles, stems, acoustic versions, live versions, studio versions, whatever it might be. 
And that's where the you know, metrics of measurement have to really change because, you know, if you look at SoundScan, it says the band sold 250,000 records. Well, I know for a fact that they made about $3 million. And in the old days, that would have been at least 2.5 million sales. So, because so of all sales, these you're different talking, parts. You're, you're picking up on Tim's point about changing the charts. And, and I, yeah. I'm intrigued the by metrics this. Of, the metrics so, of so measurement is going to I don't know, you know, in this environment, whether a chart has, I mean, frankly, whether the charts ever had any meaning anyway. I mean, I, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the industry spent vast amounts of money wanting to own the chart, and even more money actually trying to control what it actually says. <laughs> yes. so, right? So, um, we don't need to go into that, but we all know what to talk about. So, <laughs> the, the thing is that, the, the, to these days, does a chart have value? Is it, is it, what does it have to do? Is no, that well, purpose, or is it actually, is it not about social network and, and... Charts are all about perception. And if you try and set things... perception? Well, it, it, it's, it's the person trying to set it. And then to push that perception upon others to say, if it's successful, it must be good. Charts were all about marketing. Um, you know, all of the various music shows and the Grammys or whatever it might be, the Brits, that's all about marketing. It's not really about the music. And, it's, and, and all of those shows were basically created by the community that was selling the actual sure. product. I agree. And I think it's all redundant. It's obsolete, isn't it? Yeah. Archaic. It's, it's, it's like it's ridiculous. So what have you replaced? Well, it's always been replaced. Just, just, like look, just like look at YouTube. Just, just look at all of the consumption habits of the millennium generation. They're not watching prime time TV. And if they are, they're time shifting it to fit their schedules. They're all about pull. Push no longer works. It's all about pull. It's, it's, it's been replaced. We just don't want to admit it yet. I mean, do the Brits really sell records now? Do the Grammys really sell records? Well, that's what I was they have a one or they might have a one or you know two week spike, but for, for the amount of money spent do you really get a good return on your investment? Or are you just, again, setting a perception? And, you know, again, perception is pretty about marketing, trying to convince people that something is good. It's like a peer-to-peer -peer recommendation, but on a, on a much broader scale. And when you, when you think about all of those, those things, you've given us two really good examples of the way they, they, they seem to suggest a moving towards what we've talked about for a long time is the band as brand. Yes. But the beginnings of what that actually might mean. Now, you've also talked about matching the band's brand with other brands that are out there. Cause and, and, you see, and you see some power and potency in that. Well, I mean, a little bit about what you're artists have always been brands. Um, whether, they, whether they want it or not, they are. The, the fans that consume what that artist does looks at what that artist wears, what other music that artist listens to, what other causes they align themselves uh, with, you know, social, commercial, whatever it might be. They're very much into what that artist is. Something about that relationship resonates with them. Um, cause, cause alignment is, is like really about, um, a, a, good, a good example is uh, Chris Martin and you know, Fair Trade. And he's, he's, he's very passionate about it. He aligns himself with it. There's an audience that looks at that and goes, I like that, I believe in it, that resonates with me too. And so if I do something with you know, Coldplay, I feel good because it's also helping this. So it's that cause alignment. Um, if, do you, how far do you need to go with this? Because I, I, you know, well, it, it seems it, to me... It has to be authentic, <laughs> it has to make sense. Exactly. And I